Just make yourselves at home anywhere. Welcome to this Writing Center workshop on integrating sources and avoiding plagiarism. I'm Michelle Roby Gann uh, from the Writing Center. I want to encourage you as you're working on your papers to come to the Writing Center. We can help you with integrating sources smoothly and um, improving your essays, making helping make you better writers in the process. And um, the sheets that are on the tables for um, those of you here in the room with me, um, we also have some on folks online. Um, the blue gray sheet um, has our contact information and our hours. You can see we've kicked into the longer schedule. Um, and there are answers to commonly asked questions about the writing center on the front side. Backside explains how to schedule an appointment. You can be sitting at home in your jammies and make an appointment online, come in and feel all superior and everything, um, having an appointment. We encourage you to do that. Um, we also welcome drop ins as well. Um, the gold sheet has our list of workshops, and we're on the back side of this thing. Um, the next workshop you'll see is writing your scientific research paper. Some of you may be doing that or eventually doing that, maybe even next semester. Um, I encourage you to come to that. Revision strategies workshop, certainly useful for all of you. Um, that's a great workshop that um, Prentice Clark does. Um, some others that are coming up, literary analysis doesn't have to be scary for those of you who are in English 210 or planning to take it next semester. Uh, we'll also be distributing free candy because it's Halloween. Um, using commas and other punctuation, that's a brand new workshop we're trying out. I um, encourage you to come to that. Um, and how to write a portfolio introduction. For any of you folks who are in English 101 and possibly some other classes, you're putting together a portfolio at the end of the semester. So um, that's a really good workshop to go to. And then last but not least, the write-in, um, which is a four-hour extravaganza. You can drop in any time during those four hours. You don't have to be there for the entire time. And half the room, folks will be writing the other half. There will be writing consultants here from the Writing Center on hand to help you with your writing, answer your questions, um, and there will be free food and drink. So a great night. Um, so take note of that, too. Um, I'm going to be distributing a couple other um, handouts um, that are specifically for this workshop um, shortly. Uh, you'll have to do some sharing because our numbers exceeded my estimate of how many copies we would need. Uh, you just never know. And um, uh, the workshop tonight, um, uh, Integrating Sources and Avoiding uh, Plagiarism, uh, Ben Hagen is doing for us. Uh, please plan to turn off electronic devices, phones, and whatnot that might distract you during this, unless you're taking notes with your um, electronic device, um, just because it will distract not only you, but your neighbors. And um, of course, you want to give um, the presenter your complete attention and take notes. There will be hands-on activity with this. Uh, so hopefully you will know more about this topic by the end. And um, note that I will distribute comment cards toward the end. Um, so if you need an instructor notified that you're here tonight, you can put your instructor's name on that comment card. You can also get paw points for attending this workshop. And, um, just put your student ID number on the front of the uh, comment card. And um, I'll try to remind you about that at the end here. So without further ado. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm gonna just going to get started because um, I have a lot I want to do and a lot to talk about. Um, as, uh, as Michelle said, I am Ben Hagen, Dr. Hagen, uh, to some of you, um, but Ben is fine. My primary, my primary source this evening is actually going to be a rather popular textbook. Um, many of you probably don't know this book, but many teachers of writing do. It's called They Say, I Say, uh, and it takes what's called a template approach to teaching students how to integrate the words or the views of others in their own writing. 
thus the simple title, they say, I say. Students producing academic and professional writing, their coursework, um, and often even professors working on their own research can often feel lost or aimless as they try to corral enough words to meet their respective assignments. So often in the middle of creating an outline or writing a paper, you may wonder, why am I writing this? Does it really matter? And then something I try not to write on student papers anymore in courses I teach. So what? I have an argument. Almost all academic and professional writing participates in conversations that extend or can extend beyond the specific classes in which students produce it. This can apply to almost anything, whether you're writing business proposals or I just finished writing a 30-page grant proposal this afternoon, or a lab report, or an argumentative or informative research paper in a of class. Maybe you're writing an interpretive or analytical essay, again, no matter the class, whether you're writing a lit review or even if you're in English 283 and writing a poem or a short story, it seems to me if you're writing, you're in a conversation. Whether or not you submit these writings to an audience beyond the classroom, it's an opportunity to exercise a skill set that concerns how writers enter and actively engage in a collective, even if a contested, endeavor. Often, even when my upper-level English students or graduate students submit a response paper, I'll have them write on the back of it, what did you learn about yourself as a writer before turning this in? It's surprising how many of them have trouble answering the question. So this is a template. This is the kind of thing that this textbook gives to the students using it to try to get them practicing writing as a conversation. Do people know what Mad Libs are? Are those still a thing people know about? I see some nods. Some people are just giving me a death stare. So it's what's actually true in your lives. But anyway, this, this is a template writing as a conversation. So if I just read this out, in recent discussions of blank, a controversial issue has been whether blank. Looking at the rhetorical effect of this sentence, we see that this is a sentence that identifies an issue within an ongoing debate. I don't even need to know what the debate is in order to recognize what this sentence is trying to do. Looking at the next sentence, I see that there's a framing device put into the place, followed by a sentence that begins, on the other hand, a rather common strategy for mapping some voices in this controversy. The next sentence introduces a quotation. Again, I don't even have the quote, but I know partly from the punctuation, of course, but also because of the framing, what's going on here. According to this view blank, so after the presentation of the quotation, the writer is followed up by explaining the quote. The next Paragraph begins by stating the argument, stating a different argument. So the first paragraph has been a presentation of the argument of someone else. But here, my own view is blank. Though I concede that. You guys okay in front? Okay, good. Um, so this is followed then by the qualification of argument. I concede that, which then needs support with evidence. But also one can anticipate objection or response. But also there's other sorts of patterns in these two templates, shifting between general in some, and the issue is whether blank or blank, and a smaller scale supporting claim. For example, blank. The overall effect of this template is that a reader can clearly distinguish between one, the conversation as a whole, the specific views of another person and the writer's own views, largely because of the carefully crafted rhetorical savviness of the template itself. In other words, the writer has clearly avoided plagiarism or the possible appearance of plagiarism, as well as the misuse of sources. No one is going to be confused about who says what.
So I'd like you to, if you have the first activity, you've got a few handouts given to you. You should have one that says activity one on the front page, I believe. Is that true? Thank you. That's true. What I'd like you to do, take a few minutes, I'm going to give you, we have about three hours, I think, right, Michelle? All right, okay. <laughs> I'm kidding. Not to, to fill out, I usually tell that joke in every every day when I teach. I just get sick of it, but I think it's hilarious. But um, the first activity, I'd like you to fill out the template in front of you using a topic that you're familiar with. So what do you know about? So pick a topic, and then what I'd, what I'd like you to do is go ahead and invent the person you're in a conversation with. What do they say, and then what do you say in response? So this is like a math lab. I want you to fill it in. Do you want to understand the activity? Okay, so you're inventing a scenario, so what I want you to do is fill in the activity. I don't know why I can't edit it on here, but I finally figured out a way to make it work. The new website is definitely a different thing. Yeah. And I can't, when I copy and paste the link, I can no longer replace the link with what I want it to say. So I don't, it'll look kind of messy. But I'm going to have to look into seeing if I can do something else. Smooth, simple, yeah. Because I usually just say August 10th workshop, and then it takes you right to when it doesn't let me do that anymore, which is odd. Yeah. And it deleted all of the, there used to be those, like a, what it's called, it was a gadget, it said, and it was like a list of the pages, and it took that one. 
question. Last year, did we have them read them to each other at the table and then pick oh, one yeah. to read out loud? Um, yeah. Um, Seems like a good idea. Yeah, have them share um, with partners and then maybe have them be prepared to share with the entire group and then just go around each table and pick one. Um, the tables are numbered. Two is tipped over, but otherwise you can see the numbers. That no, that's better. Just never noticed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm thinking about what to write. Recent discussions of the Supreme Court. <laughs> I always loved doing mad lips on long car trips. Yeah, it's really good, I think, for developing language skills, and it's fun. Mm -hmm. Doing it with uh, sonnets is kind of fun. Like sonnets. Very fun. My little brother had to write in junior high at our high school. You do um, novel contracts. Yeah. So you read a book, you have to do five projects that go along with the book, which is a lot of preparation and stuff to do. So my little brother had to do a diorama, he made a quiz, he did vocabulary words, and then he had to do a poem that so I had to help him with. The poem. I love poetry. I love teaching poetry. Actually, I love teaching literature. There's something about poetry that feels especially great. Yeah. I always liked literature in high school. There was one book that we did in AP literature, or a story that I just can't even write. It was about like sort of like a godly thing in the sky, like preaching about like oh I can't remember what it was called. It's like something paradise. This side of paradise, maybe. Um, F. Scott Fitzgerald. Yeah, that might have been what it was. Okay. There was something, something paradise. I think that was. Was it like a 1920s? Yeah. 1920s, 1930s. Okay. I think that was the one that I did not enjoy. <laughs> I think his book, Great Gatsby, was the best. Oh, I did. I read that. That was inspired. Recent discussions of voting rights. Recent discussions of the Me weather. Yeah. In recent discussions of the weather. <laughs> My hometown got quite a bit of snow today. Oh, it must be out west. Yeah, well, more central. Uh, but it's, it's from, I'm about three hours away from here, northwest. Where? Millen. No, oh, yeah, it's about 45 minutes from here. Shocking, really. Yeah, nobody started harvesting there yet. So it's just been a big. Oh, that's bad. Yeah. But here, too, I mean, it's been so wet. Couldn't get enough rain. Okay, you're all done, I think. Um, <coughs> no? Not done? What I'd like you to do, I, 
we, all, we do only have two and a half, four hours, so we do <laughs> maybe need to move on. But one thing I'd like you to do is um, talk to each other, and some of you have a lot of people at a table. But I think it would be good if, instead of just talking with the person next to you about what you were writing, if you maybe read them out loud to each other. Um, yeah, I think that's a good idea. We're going to do that. So table nine, we'll read. And it doesn't matter if you finished or not. Just read as much as you got done. And then I'm going to walk around and listen to you while you're doing it. So, okay. Go ahead and start. Yeah. Well, I was starting to do that same thing. Can I think? Okay, I'm going to save people who didn't have to read yet by having them off. Um, 
unless you were really hoping to read your paper to each other, then, you know, the night is young, so there's all kinds of time after the workshop to read your own <laughs> writing to each other. So, anyway. I have a lot more to go over, um, so let's move on. Summarizing and quoting what they say. Although I often teach classes in which I tell my students to stop summarizing, summarizing is actually an art. It's actually a skill that comes in quite useful. Here's what Graf and Birkenstein say about it. Are people okay down on top? Thank you. So here's what they say. As a general rule, the summary requires balancing what the original author is saying with the writer's own focus. Generally speaking, a summary must at once be true to what the original author says while also emphasizing those aspects of what the author says that interests you, the writer. Striking this delicate balance can be tricky since it means facing two ways at once, both outward toward the author being summarized and inward <coughs> toward yourself. Ultimately, it means being respectful of others simultaneously structuring how you summarize them in light of your own text's central argument. In other words, good summaries are fair, but not necessarily neutral. In some sense, it's kind of impossible to write a neutral summary. They usually occur within the context of an argument. The source is being summarized, in other words, for a reason. Summarizers must carefully select, emphasize, and paraphrase the parts of another writer's work that is relevant to the argument they will be making. So you have, I think, as one of your handouts, David Zin Zinksenko's article, Don't Blame the Eater. So here's an example of a summary of that article. I'm not going to ask you to read it just yet. Okay? I just want you to have it ready at hand. So here's an example of a kind of David Zinksenko's article, Don't Blame the Eater, is nothing more than an angry rant in which he accuses the fast food companies of an evil conspiracy to make people fat. I disagree because these companies have to make money. This is not one I've invented. This is in the textbook. So, the, so this summary is an example of someone who's trying to articulate something someone else is saying but doing so in an incredibly unfair way that is rhetorically unsophisticated. Here's a much more faithful, but still critical, summary of the piece. In his article, Don't Blame the Eater, David Zinksenko blames the fast food industry for fueling today's so-called obesity epidemic, not only by failing to provide adequate warning labels on its high-calorie foods, but also by filling the nutritional void in children's lives left by their overtaxed working parents. With many parents working long hours and unable to supervise what their children eat, Zinksenko claims children today are easily victimized by the low-cost, calorie-laden foods that the fast food chains are all too eager to supply. When he was a young boy, for instance, and his single mother was away at work, he ate Taco Bell, McDonald's, and other chains on a regular basis, and ended up overweight. Zinksenko's hope is that the new spate of lawsuits against the food industry other children with, uh, with working parents will have healthier choices available to them, and that they will not, like him, become obese. In my view, however, you probably are noticing the emergence of a template here. In my view, however, it is the parents and not the food chains who are responsible for their children's obesity. While, was, while it is true that many of today's parents work long hours, there are still several things that parents can do to guarantee that their children eat healthy foods. Now, I didn't just read that whole thing to you for fun, but rather I'd like to point out some features of this summary. We see a careful articulation and framing of the original essay's arguments. You'll be reading that essay to yourself in just a few minutes. There's also a summary of its main supporting claims, carefully articulated again, and where the writer also attempts to not be too overly biased. There's also relevant emphasis for the writer's argument. With many parents working, children today are easily victimized. The single mother, 
other children are working parents, in my view, it's the parents. There's also, just pausing what I was going to say for just a second, often when students ask me how they can become better writers, I tell them to learn more verbs. Because signal verbs and verb phrases automatically make you a better writer. This summary does not, for instance, use the verb says over and over and over again. Zen Senko says, and then he says, and then he says. But rather, we have blames, claims. When he was a young boy, he ate. Zen Senko's hope is that. There is a variety of ways in which Zen Senko's positions and views are relayed to us as readers. So a bit about the art of quoting them. If summarizing is putting in your own words the views of someone else, the art of quoting is to insert the actual words someone else has used into your own sentences. It's also something of art. Common pitfalls of quoting, for in, of course, involve quoting without citing, quoting without proper punctuation, quoting too little or too much. Often when I look at the uh, Turnitin reports of students' papers, if the ratio is quite high, it doesn't necessarily mean that the student is plagiarized. It might just mean that most of the paper is quotation. Um, they may have properly cited it and quoted it, but turned it and flags it as taking language from other sources. That would be quoting too much. Quoting irrelevant passages, quoting without framing, without sandwiching, meaning there's no introduction to the quote, no explanation of the quote, or a poor introduction. Orwell asserts an idea that, or a quote by Shakespeare says, quotes don't say, by the way, quote Shakespeare is doing the saying, we would revise these to say, Orwell asserts, or in sonnet what 14 Shakespeare writes. So here's an example of what's called hit and run quoting. Forgive the rather morbid uh, phrasing there. Susan Bordeaux writes, so this is an example of bad quotation. Susan Bordeaux writes about women and dieting. Quote, Fiji is just one example. Until television was introduced in 1995, the islands had no reported cases of eating disorders. In 1998, three years after programs from the United States and Britain began broadcasting there, 62% of the girls surveyed reported dieting, end quote. I think Bordeaux is right. Another point Bordeaux makes is that we see here the same sort of template that you were all filling out, marking the argument of someone else, followed up by a very long quotation that then trans trans transitions to someone else's point of view. However, it's also just dropping a very long quote. Almost none of the words in this passage belong to the writer, but rather belong to the source. So the writer neglects to say who Bordeaux is. I mean, I know who Susan Bordeaux is, but many readers of this passage might not. The writer neglects to say that the quoted words are hers. There's also no citation. The writer does not explain how these quoted words connect with their own argument. The writer does not explain what they think is right in this quotation, simply that Bordeaux is right. Bordeaux says a lot, a lot here. So this is an example of a well-integrated quotation. I apologize for all the reading, but I have a nice voice, so it's fine. <laughs> the feminist philosopher Susan Bordeaux deplores Western media obsession with female thinness and dieting. Her basic complaint is that increasing numbers of women across the globe are being led to see themselves as fat and in need of diet. Citing the islands of Fiji as a case in point, Bordeaux notes that, and so you see a version of the quote, I won't read it again, but the version of the quote from the previous passage, which we see here. Bordeaux's point is that the Western cult of dieting is spreading even to remote places across the globe. Ultimately, Bordeaux complains, the culture of dieting will find you regardless of where you live. Bordeaux's observations ring true to me because, now that I think about it, many women I know, regardless of where they are from, worry about their weight, dot, dot, and then it carries on from there. Who is Bardo? Read in this passage, it's explained to me. What? Where are her words taken from? What's the relationship between Susan Bordeaux and this writer? I need it specifically spelled out to me. What is true about what she writes and argues? So the successes of the quotation sandwich here. 
means that one integrates sources' words into writer's own text. Note that there's no syntactic separation between the writer's sentence and both the Bordeaux quote. The green part that I've highlighted here is actually embedded in the sentence of another of the other writer. Does everyone notice that? I, hope. I know you didn't expect me to use the word syntactic probably, but right, you see how this passage is in the sentence of someone else. It doesn't start a new sentence. It demonstrates the writer's interpretation of what Bordeaux is saying. Sorry. It provides information readers need to know both about the source and about the writer's own position. It builds a bridge after the quotation to the writer's own words. It turns 62% into a clear and relevant piece of information rather than just an inert statistic. It paraphrases what Bordeaux is saying. It also sets up the writer's argument, which is another issue for another workshop. So this is where I want you to begin your second activity, which is a little more labor intensive than the first one. I know the first one was really hard, and so this one's going to ramp up the time kidding. Right? Well, hopefully it wasn't that hard. Maybe it was hard. Who knows? All right, so the instructions, what I'd like to do for the second one is I'd like you to do precisely what this writer does. I'm going to read these instructions, so just bear with me a little bit. I'd like you to imagine that you are writing an essay about the fast food industry and childhood obesity. Using the templates provided on the workshop handout, choose a passage from the Zinsenko essay, which you have access to in front of you, and construct a frame around it, much like we see here. Remember to, one, include information about who Zinsenko is. Refer to bio information on the bottom of page 241 of the essay and the general sense of what he is writing or attempting to achieve, try to do so concisely. Indicate that the words are, in fact, Zinsenko when introducing the quotation. Make sure to include an in-text citation. Explain the relevance or elaborate the point of the quotation in your own words. And I'd also like you to start a new paragraph that transitions into your own argument and clarifies your qualified agreement or disagreement with Zinsenko. So in other words, everything that happens rhetorically in the paragraph I've just been talking about. I'll put that up again so you can see it. There. Okay. So you should probably start by reading Zinsenko's essay to yourself or out to each other, and then I'd like you to get to work.
I'm going to give you just a few more minutes. I do have about 25 more slides to get through, so I'm just fine. That's it's really the end right now. But anyway, but just a few more minutes to write. Okay, this is what I want you to do. Like last time, I'd like everyone at the table to read what they've gotten finished, even if you didn't finish the whole activity. I'd like you to read what you have out loud. And then there's a part two this time. So is everyone paying attention? One person at the table will be volunteered, or will volunteer if they're brave, to read what they wrote aloud to the whole group. So we to get started. Or I'll just pick people randomly. <laughs> get all the way around yeah, probably. Um, and not every and some tables will check so it'll be fine they'll do a sigh of relief What's that? <laughs> they'll do a sigh of relief <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
So we've got somebody shared online. Um, they do. Um, you can stay with them. Um, hold down, hold it down, hold the uh, button on the microphone. So, and stress that this is so everybody around this long room can hear, and also the people online. Did every table pick someone? Hear a lot of chatter, so that must mean yes, right? So what I'd like to do is I'm going to choose tables. Um, or actually, we can have volunteers. Would anyone want to volunteer to read theirs? Okay, what I would like to do, you see there's microphones on your table. Push the button and hold it down while you speak into it. That way everyone in this long room can hear and people online will hear you as well. So you're streaming live, my friend. Okay, go for it. Obesity is not a new problem, but a growing pandemic. Children are being attacked by the simplicity and ease or easy access that is food, fast food. As written by chief editor of uh, men's health magazine, Zinzinko, uh, Zinzinko states that before 1944, diabetes in children was generally caused by five genetic disorders and, uh, and about only, one second, let me make sure I don't misquote that, sorry. Only about 5% of childhood cases were, I'm sorry, was generally caused by five genetic disorders. Only about 5% of childhood cases were obesity related. Uh, end quote, two, or 242. The nation has since grown out of these five genetic, five genetic disorders and into an eating, um, eating caused obesity. Since Zinco continues, today, dot, 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 type two diabetes, type two diabetes, Type 2 diabetes accounts for at least 30% of all new cases of childhood um, obesity, end quote, Zane Single 242. Personally, I believe that this increase in the amount of obesity cases are not caused by fast food, but are directly caused by a lack of home cooking. We give the young man a round of applause. 
we have time for about eight more, I think. So, um, <laughs> does that joke Was that a volunteer? No? Yes, at table nine. Be sure to press the button. Okay, so, the president of Galvanized Brands, David Zinchenko, in an article against the fast food industry, made a clear argument about the lack of alternatives for fast food chains, which in turn is a strong factor towards obesity in children. In the article, he tells one to drive down any thoroughfare in America, you'll see one of the country's more than 13,000 McDonald's restaurants, but then to also drive back, find some place to buy a great food. In making this statement, Zinchenko insists that because of the convenience of these restaurants, specifically McDonald's, people will, will resort to them more often. Zinchenko makes a good point when speaking about convenience. As human beings, we naturally want to do things the easy way when we don't think about the consequences. This includes eating. Wonderful. We just... That's really quite good. Thank you very much. Well, I want to point out two things you may have not have noticed when you were working on this activity, but in the little packet I gave you, there is a page that lists a bunch of useful verbs that I believe your professors would appreciate you trying to incorporate into your writing. And there are also other sorts of templates that might help you frame the kinds of quotations and the kinds of paragraphs and sentences I had you practice this evening. Otherwise, I think we're a little early, but I've had enough of today, and I imagine you have too. So thank you. Remember, if you want your instructor notified that you're here to put your instructor's name on the card, and if you want to put your student ID number on your card, put your card. When you get them filling out your comment card, you can turn it in to either Liz or me. Yep. I wasn't sure because I sent it like through the form. Oh, okay. I don't know if like yeah. it was just me not doing it correctly. <laughs>